thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, welcome to our September UC Master Gardener series at San Mateo County Libraries. Uh, Master Gardener Leslie Munneman will present California Native Gardening. Please join us next month for container gardening on Thursday, October 21st at 4 p.m. And I'll put the link in the chat for you to register. Uh, feel free to post your questions in the chat located at the bottom of your tool, Zoom toolbar. If you'd like to access live closed captions, click on the CC icon in your toolbar and then click show subtitle. Uh, this presentation and its recording will also be emailed to all registrants. And without further ado, thank you and welcome, Leslie. Thank you. Thank you, Jenna. And uh, hello, everybody. Um, let's see. Uh, I want to especially thank Jenna for uh, being super support. Uh, I haven't done very many Zoom presentations, but uh, um, here we go. So my garden, I am located in the southernmost part of uh, uh, San Mateo County, and uh, it's hot down here. If anyone's hiked up to the dish off of I-280 and Alpine Road, the, I am at the foot of that uh, dish, and uh, you cross San Francisco Creek, which is the boundary between uh, Santa Clara County and San Mateo County, and I am one house uh, uh, of that boundary. So it's pretty hot here, and as you can see in this photograph, it's very sunny in parts of my yard. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you the, the uh, kind of the evolution of this uh, yard of ours and the learning process that went along with it. And it's been a whole family experience. Uh, my husband and I bought our house in 1986. And so we've been here for a while. And uh, we've had uh, a lot of interaction with the yard and the area. But before I get on to that, I have to tell you about the UC Master Gardeners, which I am a part of that program. We're in San Mateo County and San Francisco County. It's a part of the University of California. Uh, it's, think of, uh, this is the way the university returns uh, the fruits of our tax dollars, their research in agriculture via the Master Gardeners. And we are all volunteers. And uh, we just recently uh, um, uh, uh, interviewed uh, over 100 candidates for our next training, of which I think 32 or 36 were selected, to give you an idea how, how uh, uh, difficult this is to uh, come up with a class, which is starting in January. And anyone in our county or in Santa and uh, San Francisco County were, you know, all the counties in California have a master gardener program. This is our program in San Mateo and San Francisco County. So if you're in this area and you've ever had any interest in becoming a master gardener, this is how you do it. And these are some of the um, uh, uh, programs that we offer, the services we offer. We have a garden helpline. And at the end of this presentation, I think I put in the times and uh, right now everything is via Zoom, of course. So you have to call or do it, uh, uh, do it online, uh, it's not in person, but when we go back to in person, you can go in and talk to a real person. Uh, so we have the train the trainer, that's a for uh, people that work in school gardens, like staff and parents. We have several demonstration, we have habitat gardens, that's a new thing now, and I'll talk about that later in the presentation. And we volunteer and have presentations and educational classes at all these, different events. And uh, this is one of them. All right. So how are California plants, uh, California native plants different? Uh, they've basically, they've evolved, they've adapted to the weather and to the, to the, the environment that we live in. Uh, they're the ones that have survived through thick and thin. And uh, they're the ones that when you go hiking, you will probably see all over the place. I know that we were on Montero once and I couldn't believe that I actually saw a beautiful, beautiful big coffee berry bush, which we have in our front yard and they are gorgeous, but out in, in nature, just in the natural setting, they are stunning. They are quite beautiful. Now, uh, I'm the uh, my yard is riparian. It fits that, um, 
even though the, everything is very dry here, uh, it is next to a creek. And most of the plants that uh, uh, grow around here are riparian plants. They, the, they uh, have adapted to, uh, you know, when they're near the creek or when there's moisture, they've adapted to that. And when it's dry, they've adapted to that. So one of the rules that we teach in Master Gardeners is right plant, right place. And, and that couldn't be more true for native plants because they, uh, they are finicky and they, uh, some will uh, want moisture and some want it dry, want it sunny, want it hot. So there's, you really need to pay attention to what the plants needs are. And in my garden, it's mostly riparian plants. Although, like I said, there are some very dry spots in my yard. And, and uh, for that, we have to find the plant that is gonna be happiest in that location. Um, there you go, right place, right plant. Uh, now, the way that my husband and I, uh, we, like I said, we bought this place in 1986. And uh, when we bought it, it had been fully landscaped by no other than Roger Reynolds. It was a very, uh, you know, uh, the person that, that had sold us a house, she liked it. We didn't like it very much. And sure enough, we, we had a one-year-old and later on had two more kids and it, it reverted to its natural state because we were busy raising a family and working and we neglected the yard and it just slowly but surely just returned to its natural state. Most of the plants died, it got weedy, we didn't have time to take care of it. So, you know, over those years we kept talking about, you know, we, wanna, we wanted a native garden. We like this environment and we wanted our, our yard to look like what was surrounding it. And the way we did that was we went to a lot of these uh, 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 native garden tours that happen every year. And this is where you find out about that. Every year they happen. Right now, because again of COVID, uh, a lot of these tours are recorded uh, and you can watch them on, on the YouTube channel. And uh, I highly recommend that you do this because it's one of the best ways to learn about what other people have done, what's worked, and you get to see it in a landscape setting and decide what it is that you like. And you also get to know, uh, you get to learn about the, the professionals out there that are doing this kind of designing. There are both landscapers and uh, designers. Uh, okay, and as you can see here, it's California Native Plant Society. That is the place to go. This is what you what you what you see when you go to these tours. You find magnificent products like this. This is, believe it or not, this is a native. And uh, when I saw it, I couldn't believe it because it's just so spectacular. This is happens to be in a garden designed by Master Gardeners of San Mateo County. It's at the uh, San Carlos uh, Public Library. And they have a pollinator and habitat garden there. And one year their mallow just went berserk and produced this beautiful, this must be more than one bush, but anyway, I thought it was spectacular. And so don't think that just because they're natives that they're ugly. They, you know, they, some, some are prettier some parts of the year than other times. And, but you can plan your garden so that you have a continuous show of pretty things or whatever it is that you desire. All right, so let's go on to the next thing. So why we chose native plants? Because we wanted to conserve water. Obviously, California is really a desert. The only reason that parts of California are green because we water like crazy and water costs money. And being a very uh, frugal person, I don't like to spend money. Our water bill is over $100. This is through the California uh, uh, water, whatever it is. But uh, it, so the, it, it's not free. So, you know, I wanted to make sure that we were not, you know, a landscape, a pretty landscape, conventional landscape garden usually uses a lot of water. So uh, our thinking was we wanted it to look like our environment and we wanted to conserve water. We also wanted it to attract animals, wildlife, 
you know, nice wild. I mean, we don't need to work hard at that because we are kind of in a rural part of the neighborhood and we do have a lot of uh, uh, visitors. We have owls at night, we have hawks, we had skunks when I first, uh, the first year we were here and I remember I thought, oh my god, what do I do? You know, do I call 911? I said, wait a minute, you know, you live in, in out in the country now, you know, the, the skunks are just part of the environment. And we want to encourage pollinators. And you can do all that with natives if you think it through. Now, this is what we ended up doing was we, we, um, we went on these tours, we looked at what we liked, we decided what it was we wanted, and then we tried out different people. You know, they're not expensive. The, the uh, designers, a lot of them go to the junior colleges and they get trained to do landscape design. Uh, and they can draw up a design, uh, give you an idea of what might work in your yard, or you can hire an architect, which is somebody who has the four or more year degree from a uh, university. And we tried both and ended up with a landscape architect. And uh, this is what she came up with. And uh, we were, uh, this is our driveway, this is our front yard here. And this driveway, is porous. It's porous concrete and uh, it's colored to match the stone. All these, uh, the, the hardscape in our yard is, uh, um, is stone and we tried to match it to the natural stone in, in the environment. And then, uh, so you can look at, I don't know if I put a link on this, but you can look at this on your own and get an idea of what a, a landscaper would come up with with your yard. That's the front yard and here's the backyard. And she did something that I thought was very helpful to me at least. She came up with three plans with different ideas of how to use the space. So we decided that we uh, were gonna do the front and the back. So we're doing the whole caboodle. And we decided to have to pay somebody to do this because this was a big project and it's, you know, even if you do it on your own, you're going to spend some money. And so I decided that, yes, this is worth uh, uh, investing some money in. This is going to be something that is going to last us until, you know, we, re, you know, we go to a nursing home or somewhere else. Uh, so so uh, we had her, um, she came up with three different plans with different ideas in those different plans. And I looked at the three plans that said, I like this. I like this, I like this, I like this. And we circled them in red and then she went back and she drew the plan to including those features. And one of the things I really liked was that she took out all of the aggregate that was our back patio and uh, reused it. It all became stepping stones in the side yard here. And then she put in these beautiful big planter boxes for gardening because uh, my husband and I, at the time that we did this, we're in our 50s, so we're now in our 60s. And if we live here to the age that his parents were, when they have finally had to go to nursing home, it's probably our 90s. But, you know, we want a space that we can use as we age. So we had these, the gardening was raised so that as we get older, we can still continue to garden. Uh, and then we, she created, uh, she put in a greenhouse, which surprised me. She had one on her property. So I, uh, I was very surprised that she was able to fit one on mine. And I love that little greenhouse. And then she put in a, a, a separate kind of a private patio area. There's two right here. There's two sliding doors that go into bedrooms that belong to my children. And we thought, okay, if we ever need to rent rooms, then we can have these the these rooms rented, and this could be the private patio, and people can come and go. There's locks on the sliding doors; they can come through through the backyard here. So that was our thinking when when she came up with her different ideas. So what I'm saying is that it was worth it to us to hire a professional. Here, here's an aerial view of our, uh, and you can do this for yourselves too. Just go to Google Maps and type in your address and then look for aerial view and you can enlarge it. And that's what I did. And then I just did a, uh, um, 
a capture of that photograph so you could see here are the planter boxes in my yard it gives you a good idea of the sun on your property which is really important to know when you're gardening you want to know where the sun is and in, in, in the training that we got through Master Gardeners, we had to, to really think about the, the course of the sun. So this over here is the east, over here is the west. So the sun goes from the east to the west. We get morning sun on this side and afternoon sun on this side. And then, uh, uh, so this is in the sun most of the day and this is our sunny spot back here too. So this is what, it looked like when it was brand new. It doesn't look like this anymore. It's it's quite overgrown. Uh, these bushes in here have pretty much taken over. There's an apricot here that is gigantic. And uh, when I first gave this native plant uh, uh, garden presentation with a friend, uh, uh, we're both uh, master gardeners and we're about the same age. And we were laughing because when we started, we thought, oh, natives, you know, there's less, you know, you put them in the ground and then, you know, the rain takes care of them. Well, that's not true. Natives have to be managed not as much as a conventional garden, but they're still there. You still have to prune them. You still have to make sure that they're getting watered properly. And, and uh, so they, they are not free of care. And so I learned that pretty quickly once my garden was in and I set myself to learn how to take care of my native plants. Now, in our property, the backyard, uh, this house was built in 62 and it was never uh, um, flattened. You know, they didn't, uh, it's basically the way it was when the fellow bought this lot. And so there's a ravine that goes down it slopes down into here and San Francisco Creek is behind us as you're looking in this direction and when we have floods as we did back in in 97 and San Francisco overflows that runoff goes through this ravine and it goes through this property here and it goes down that way and then it joins up with San Francisco on the other way I mean this is just the way you know, uh, our terrain is naturally. So we took that slope and she very cleverly uh, turned it into a swale, which I think is gorgeous. I think of all the spots in my yard, this is my absolute favorite. Um, and we took all the rock that uh, we had collected on our property, just digging over the years. And from our neighbors, we put out a, 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 a email to everybody in the neighborhood uh, to save all the rock that they dig up in their garden. And we had a gigantic pile in our front yard for like 20 years. Uh, and this was thrown into this swale here and used in our water features. So um, this is looking north. And uh, right here, you can see the slope and the the the, the other smart thing that the she and the, the guys that installed the garden uh, did was they took the downspouts and they connected them underground. So they dug little uh, um, tunnels or little uh, channels with the pipes to, to direct the rainwater from the house into the swale, which is where it should go, right? Down, down the slope. Now here you can see, and you're gonna see a picture later on and it's shocking. Uh, this is right after it was planted and it started to grow. And right here on this post and on this post are two uh, native grapes. And you won't believe how those things grew. They cover this thing. I mean, there's no sunlight now. Uh, let's see, let me show you another picture here. Oh, this is the other side of the swale, just to give you an idea of uh, the slope here. And uh, these are the planter boxes that uh, I love. And here's the uh, arbor. And uh, these are among my favorite plants. And I, they come in different, uh, it's a, a California fuchsia. And it comes in a mounding form, which is the variety that I have. And it also comes in, a, in an upright form. 
Uh, and uh, here's the apricot, which fills the space right here. There's no, uh, I mean, it's almost dark. And then in here, we put in some, uh, a hedge. It's a holly cherry ictifolia, prunus ictifolia, I think it's called. And I'll show you pictures of that later on. All right, so there's there's a California fuchsia that I I think is just spectacular, um, and um, unfortunately because it's underneath the apricot, it doesn't get enough sun to bloom. It's still alive, and it, as soon as uh, you know we can uh, give it some sunlight, it will uh, start blooming like that again. And it is like I say, it's one of my favorites. Now, this is that little private yard that I talked about. Here's my greenhouse. And uh, the private yard, we fenced it off and put a little gate in there. Now you can see here on the ground, uh, there's pieces of aggregate. So what the, the landscape person did was she incorporated and the, the guys that installed it, they all worked together. They took some of the flagstone and mixed it with the aggregate and made the patio uh, uh, with that. Oops, let me go back. And uh, so that way we didn't take anything to the dump. Everything stayed on site and that was important to us. These are the, the stones that I talked about in the water features. These are stones that were dug up on our property and on our neighbor's properties. And we just saved them and, and then the guys put them into a beautiful water feature. Right here is a snag. Now, I want you all to notice that in my uh, presentation, I've highlighted some items like this word here, snag. And uh, what that means is that I've embedded a link for you to click on when you get your, uh, when you get your PDF of this presentation. Uh, I've embedded a link that will take you to a website online that gives you a lot more information about that subject, explains it more. And snags, we had a, a walnut tree that was dead on the property. So we cut it down and the wood of walnuts are beautiful. It's kind of white, uh, papery. And so we saved pieces of the trunk and scattered them around the, uh, uh, on the wood chips. And what that does is that the insects use them as a habitat. They drill holes in it, or if they live there, already they continue to live there and so it's just it's just a, a, a home for insects and uh, it's part of the natural environment and so I, I kept that and I like it very much. This is a fig which uh, I had intentionally wanted to create a um, um, I'm, I'm missing the word right now where you um, uh, you shape it to, against the fence. And uh, I didn't do that. And figs will grow very big if you don't prune them. So one of the things we learn, master gardeners, is that if you want your fruit trees to be, you know, you want to be able to reach them, you have to prune them down to size and keep pruning them year after year. Uh, this is a discipline of keeping your your the trees that grow the right size. You have to keep pruning them so they don't get out of bounds. And uh, I let this go for 10 years. And then one day I decided, okay, I am going to espalier. That's what I was looking for. I want to create a espalier of this, uh, of this uh, fig. And so I cut it and we thought for sure I, was, I had killed it because I butchered the damn thing. And uh, no, it came right back. It's beautiful. It's nice and bushy. And I'm in the process of trying to train with weights on the branches, trying to train the branches to bend and, and to shape them into the way I want so that I can uh, um, attach them to these uh, slats on the fence. This one uh, is a ceanothus. It didn't survive uh, the drought. Uh, and my uh, ignorance uh, killed the poor thing. Uh, and these things happen. Right in here is the coyote bush. And this plant is unbelievably vigorous. Uh, I gave it, I cut it down to the ground and it came right back the next year as if nothing had happened. It just uh, is, it is so darn tough. Now, this is the arbor that I was talking about. And I should start with this one. This is what that the the grapevine that I told you about the native grapevine looks like now that it's mature. 
I mean, this thing is just all over the place. And look at that shade in there. This is because I'm not very good at pruning. I mean, I do it. It's just hard work. And uh, so I've, I've been neglectful. And this is what it looks like when you don't take care of things. But in the wintertime, the beauty of this variety, the, the Roger Red is a cross between a native California grape and some other grape, probably a British grapevine. And um, this is what it looks like in, in the fall. And uh, it, that's, that's its claim to fame, Roger Red. And it is really spectacular. Now, one of the problems with it for us is that we have furniture underneath and it does produce fruit and it's kind of puny, it's small. It's not really meant to be edible, even though my th son thought that he could eat them. They're not very good, but they do fall on the ground, the fruit, and they do stain. So every summer we have to go in there and clip all those little uh, clumps of grapes off so that they don't stain the furniture or the stone. This is our, our new patio, which replaced the uh, aggregate. And it's not uh, uh, mortared in, it's all, everything is in sand so that the water will percolate down to the, to, the, to the groundwater. That was important. All right, so as I said, I embedded the information that where you can learn more about these different kinds of plants. Uh, this is a California fuchsia, and this link will take you to uh, the Calscape, which is uh, a fabulous website uh, for native plants. Uh, it's for beginners. It's probably all you need. There is so much to learn on that website. So click on these links, and uh, it will take you to Calscape and tell you more about these uh, varieties of plants. All right, let's go to the next one. So in my front yard, I have the ribes, and I've discovered that uh, ribes is very, very happy in my yard. It grows very well. Once we put it in the ground, uh, we watered everything, all the new plants were put in. I think they, they used either one gallon, a few or five gallons uh, of plants that they put in the ground and we, we did install irrigation, a drip system. And they did, uh, they received drip, I, I believe it was three minutes, three times a week. And that's the thing with the natives. And that's where most people have trouble is uh, getting those newly planted plants, the right amount of water so that they get their roots into the ground and, and then once they're established, after about a year, you, you don't water them anymore. They're dependent on rainwater. That's all they need. And so once uh, our plants were established, after that year, we turned the irrigation off and uh, depended completely on rainwater. Most of the plants have done well. A few of them, because we've had multiple years without rain, have gotten stressed. The, the leaves uh, on the evergreens turn yellow. And uh, uh, like I said, the ceanothus uh, got, uh, it was in the sun year after year and it didn't get any, any rain or any, any drip. So that one finally uh, uh, died. But this one is in shade, it's under oaks in the front yard. This is a hybrid and called King Edward. And like the ribes, uh, like the uh, uh, Roger Red, it's a cross between a native and probably a British variety of uh, ribes. And it's bushy, it's big, and it has spectacular flowers on it. I absolutely love this plant. It's very easy to propagate too. You, you, when I prune it, I take the branches and I just stick them in the ground and a, a, more often than not they will root and I will, or the, the, the seeds from the flowers also get scattered around the yard and I have many volunteers which I dig up. This is what you see when you go out hiking. This is the native uh, uh, current and it is still very pretty. It has a very beautiful graceful uh, uh, spread 
the way the, the branches just branch out. It's not as full or as big or as vibrant as the hybrid, but I still think it, and it's very, very tough. This plant was dug up from our original yard before we landscaped, put in a pot. It sat there for a few months while we landscaped, and then we re replanted it in, it in this location, and it survived the whole time. So they are pretty tough. This is another beauty. This one is uh, in our backyard on our patio. And this is what it looks like for a very, uh, the flower is beautiful. A very short time in the, in the summertime, I believe it is. Uh, and then once it stops blooming, it, most of the year, this is what it looks like in my yard because I don't water it enough. If I watered it more, it, pro it pruned it properly, got rid of the dead stuff, it probably wouldn't look as untidy as it does here. Uh, but it is, when it is in bloom, it is, I mean, look, it's just such a beautiful flower. Uh, let's see, what else do we have? Oh, so we have the elderberry. Now we have a next door neighbor and we have a second story. So our second story looks into our next door neighbor's yard and their house. So we thought, well, we should have something here to screen that. And sure enough, this elderberry does, the, does it very, very well. So uh, this is a bush and we keep trying to make it in a tree, but it wants to be a bush. So it, 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 it just has multiple stems and uh, it, it can get very, um, you can prune these back. They're quite thick, as you can see here. It takes a saw, you can't really just, take pruners to it. You can probably take, you know, extra strong pruners to it or uh, the, the uh, but it, it is a, a pretty substantial tree. It has berries. Uh, we've tried uh, eating them. They don't taste like much, but they certainly are pretty. I, I love the color. And this uh, uh, does provide some shade. It's uh, it, and it is deciduous, so it does lose its leaves in the, in the winter time, but uh, that's fine with me because then the parts of the garden that doesn't get any sun in the winter time get some get some sun. Uh, all right, so here's a creek dogwood. Now, this is in my yard. I bought it. I stuck it in the ground. I'm not real happy with it because it is very, very rangy. It has a beautiful stem, as you can see here. That's what it's famous for, that red stem. But it is, it, it just, it's so, it just spreads all over. The, the branches are big and long and they just spread all over the place. So it needs a very large area to, to grow in. And it's very tough. It seems like every time I pull it up, I, it, it appears somewhere else in my yard. So, uh, and you know, it is pretty in the, in the, in the uh, uh, fall, it does change colors and the flowers are pretty. They're small, but uh, it's claimed to fame are these, uh, the branches when the leaves fall off. They're red and, they, and they're, they're very pretty. Now, here's another uh, plant that, uh, this is kind of a tragic story. The people that sold us a house had planted this, uh, what somebody called a Portuguese laurel. They, they told me it was not a native, that they identified it, and I stupidly removed this thing. And I had pruned it. It was a bush. I turned it into a tree, and once it became a tree, it got sunlight, and then it started looking like this. I mean, this is just, I find this spectacular. And foolishly, I took it out and replaced it with choke cherry which uh, has not, it, it has not grown fast enough to, to I wish I hadn't taken the, the prunus out, or the Portuguese laurel out. It, it is very beautiful. I love these panicles of white flowers just cascading and they turn into to berries, which the, the animals like, the birds will get them. But this is the next, this is the, the native version and it's called choke cherry. I have two of them in the ground and I've had them for a few years and they, they grow very, very slowly, which is one of the things that people criticize native plants. They do, they do once you put them in the ground, they get established and some of them will grow quickly, but some of them are very slow. For instance, we have a toyon, uh, I may have a picture in here somewhere, 
Uh, and that took years before we ever got any fruit on it. Uh, you know, it took about five years before that thing really matured in, into what it was supposed to be. This is what our environment looks like in our neighborhood around the dish. We have a lot of, a lot of the buckeye, which is the, the um, chestnut. We call it horse chestnut in some parts of the country. And uh, th that is a beautiful native. They're all along 280. As you drive along 280 from Alpine Road to Page Mill, you see them up on the hills there on the, on the, on the western side. And uh, when they're in bloom, they are just spectacularly beautiful. This is what they look like when they're, uh, we get these all on our driveway, on our street, all over the place because we're surrounded by them. And then we, when we drive over them, they also, uh, they will um, root in the ground by themselves. You don't have to plant them. They'll just appear all over the place. They're just amazing plants. This is another one that I love that's in my yard. It's called the mock orange. And it does have a fragrance, not exactly orange, but it does have a fragrance. Um, I transplanted it. And since I transplanted it, it hasn't really looked like this. So uh, uh, I, I still have to figure out what I'm doing wrong. Maybe it just uh, it has to acclimate itself to that site. Maybe it's the wrong site. I'm still trying to learn uh, uh, what this plant needs. But it is a very, very pretty bush. Uh, this is a ground cover, supposedly, but it kind of, you know, fills a space. It's, uh, uh, it's a ribes, another ribes, uh, uh, um, but it's uh, more of a ground cover. And again, it was very slow to get established, but now it is filled in our space and uh, it's very easy to propagate. You just take one of the branches and, and, and remove some of the leaves and take the branch and stick it in the soil and put a rock on it and it will root into the ground and that's one way to to propagate it so that's been fun to do uh it doesn't take you know we don't water it and it's green it's green year round and and it it, it you know it covers up the bare spaces uh here is the holly cherry this is the one that was against the fence, our neighbor's fence that I told you that it filled in and, um, you know, it's uh, um, a hedge, basically. And you can prune it, and we don't prune it enough. We've kind of let things go uh, wild, natural, and so it's a little too bushy back there. This is a picture from my yard. And this is what it looks like when it has berries and they're very pretty. They don't, you, you have to get up close to see them, but they are there and the leaves are shiny and uh, it makes a very good hedge. Uh, let's see, this is a vine. It's a, one of the few native vines uh, and it is on a uh, arbor, I guess. Uh, over our garage. So there's a support over our garage for this plant. And uh, it has never looked like this. I believe it doesn't get enough sun. And the other thing that I don't like about this is that it is extremely fragile. Every time I touch one of the stems, they break. It's almost like glass. They are so fragile. Now I've seen this plant and there's another one uh, uh, has a similar name um, that uh, grows wild. And the way they will grow wild is they basically climb over other bushes. So they will just scramble over other bushes and fences. They don't have little uh, uh, twining uh, tendrils that, that, uh, that will, you, you, have to, so you have to help it onto the support pretty much. I mean, at least, you know, we had wires from the ground up to the, to the arbor that was over the garage, and I had to tie it up there to get it to the, up to the uppermost point. But it is very fragile, and so I believe that I'm going to replace this with something else. I'll probably leave it in the ground. What, one thing that I've noticed that it's done is that uh, left unattended, it will just become a ground clever. 
and it it does recede itself i've seen it in other parts of my yard so i just let it you know i let things do their thing and just watch and and if i don't like it i tear it out or i move it put it somewhere else all right so the best place for you to start other than going on those tours uh, with the going uh, native garden tour is uh, California uh, uh, Native Plant Society. And in our area, we have uh, one in Santa Clara County and we have one in San Francisco County. They're both very active. Uh, you can join them. Uh, you will learn a ton. Now, Scalscape is the website that uh, I recommend that you go to, to to learn about plants. I I it is practically like uh, some people go to Facebook, I go to Cowscape. I love exploring uh, plants, learning about them, looking at their pictures. I've taken up watercolor, so that's where I go to get close up pictures of flowers to paint. And uh, uh, there are many things that you can do with Cowscape. And one of the uh, most helpful is you go into their search and you can search by address. And so I've, I've given you a capture of uh, me doing this and it shows you I plugged in my address and it gives you all this information about my location, just my address. And here it tells me all the native plants that will grow in my, in my uh, area, right? You know, for my address pretty much. So there's a lot to choose from. You can do that for yours. You can do the advanced search and these are all the different things that you can learn about your, uh, 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 the different things that you can pick, the different features that you can pick for your for your garden. Here, uh, it will show you when you uh, it gives you the um, the plants that you get. You can click on each one, and each one will take you to many many pictures of that plant, and it will tell you uh, uh, what that uh, you know what conditions that plant needs to grow, how big it gets, what nurseries to go to. Uh, to buy that plant, that there's everything you need to know is is right here on Calscape. Uh, let's see, what else do I have here? Oh, so these are the, what I did was you can also set up a My Native Plants. So you, you subscribe to Calscape, you just put in your email, cre create an account, and then you create a, a, a My Plants your website where you can plug in all your wish for plants. These are the plants that are in my garden. So that's what I started doing. I have a list here. It's kind of like a bulletin board of all the plants that I that I have in my yard. Now, another new feature of Cowscape, and this is very cool, is you can go in there and and this is just one example. They had different things that you could pick, uh, 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 different gardens that you could pick different styles. You can have an outdoor garden or a, this almost looks like an oriental garden, but it will give you their idea and then it will give you, um, I can't read that here, but it'll give you design, just just ideas for you to explore. You you may take take that idea or you may combine it with something else, but I, th I thought it was a very cool idea, a very nice thing to offer us. And here are resources. Now, each one of these has a link embedded. And when you click on it on your PDF, it will take you to that website where you can learn all these different things. Um, let's see, Calscape and the California Native Plant Society are my go-to places. And we, you know, going native garden tour is part of uh, California Native Plant Society. Uh, and, they have list of professionals. I put a link in here. I think it's from that page too. And you can use a, a, a landscape designer who's gone to a horticulture program, like they have an excellent horticulture program at Foothill and uh, they've been trained on design uh, or you can get a landscape architect. And here are lists of many so that you can uh, learn about that. Then this is one of my favorite conversion. Uh, uh, it's not a video, I think it's a slideshow, but it's a gal in Redwood City and you can actually go to her, her address and see the, the growing garden now. She did it years ago, but it, she gives you step-by-step step 
how she converted her lawn. And I believe that some water uh, companies will give you a rebate if you convert your lawn to a native garden. So that's something to look into. Um, all these are different possibilities to, uh, um, there is so much out there, but I tried to give you the things that are the most helpful. I couldn't figure out how to do this PDF as a link. So you're going to have to email me if you're, it's a, it's a very good list of plants to choose from. Uh, uh, here is the email discussion. I believe this is, a, uh, it's growing, uh, it's a native plant group. And uh, once you subscribe to it, you will get emails from going back and forth from people. Uh, a lot of them are professionals in the, in the uh, landscaping uh, field that, uh, and, and then there are also just uh, guard, uh, people that have native plant questions. Um, so that is my presentation. And uh, I hope this has been helpful. I hope that you feel comfortable contacting me anytime. Here's my email. I'm happy to, to correspond with you and to uh, help you find uh, resources or answer your questions the best way I can. So that's about it. Do you, were there any questions on the chat? Uh, yep, you've got a few questions and uh, feel free if anyone has any more questions, you can add them in. Uh, first question you received was, uh, all, are all figs native to California? Are all what? Uh, figs. Like figs? Figs. I, gee, I don't know about that. I don't think so. I don't know. I don't know. I can't imagine that they would all be native to California. Figs? No, I don't think so. But I'm not an expert on figs. So I would have to look that up. If anybody, question. if anybody knows the answer to that, insert it in the chat. Another question about, uh, does the ribes need shade or full sun? The ribes? Ribes? Ribes, R-I-B-E-S? Yes. It seems to be happiest in, in moderate shade. It can tolerate some sun, but mine are mostly in underneath oaks in the front yard. And that's, they seem to be just gorgeous. They seem to be very happy there. And I don't water them. Supposedly, they don't like water, and they've survived drought. They, they are not one of the plants that have uh, complained because of the drought. So they must have very, very, very deep roots, uh, like the oaks, I'm guessing, because they are, you know, they just keep going, and uh, nothing seems to phase them. Uh, you've got some answers in the chat about figs. Uh, they're saying they can't be na all natives because they're a staple of Mediterranean cuisine and that they've also originated in Asia, then made their way towards the Mediterranean. Yeah. Well, uh, I'll tell you that I would say that my, my climate, my space is very much like a Mediterranean space. I grow fig and I also have pomegranate and they are both incredibly happy so if you are in this neck of the wood those are two fruit trees that you you won't go wrong with they are very very tough and very easy to grow and very very productive oh, it looks like they're it was not answered. native they're not native and you do need to water them yep someone else has said there are no native figs in california oops sorry Hello. closing Hello. announcement yes. Please let us uh, know there's another question is, sorry, let me, let me mute a moment. Okay, uh, there's another question about, uh, we forgot to prune our fig tree. Uh, how much did you prune, five foot or more? And did you do it in October or January? I did it when it was dormant, which is winter time, I believe. So when all the leaves fall off the tree is when I pruned it. And I pruned it severely. Uh, I, uh, you know, I, if, if you email me, I will send you a picture. I butchered it. I mean, I cut that thing back uh, so severely that I thought that there's no way it's going to recover. And it just, it sprouted 
branches where I never imagined branches could sprout, but it filled in and within a year, it was nice and bushy again. So it's very, very tough. So you, you probably can't, you can't really damage that fig tree. They are tanks. Assuming that it's a mature fig. If it's a young fig, then they're a little more fragile. But when you, when you do a spalier, you, you take a, a, a plant and you cut it so that it's about knee high. The main trunk is about knee high. So it's only, got, you know, you've only got like two feet off the ground. That's how you start in a spalier. And then the branches grow from that trunk. And that's how you start training those branches into the shape that you want. There's also, it's not a question, but I just thought you might want to talk about it a bit more. Uh, someone mentioned examples of native plant gardens at Woodside Library, San Carlos City Center, uh, Gamble Garden in Palo Alto. Do you have any other suggestions for people? Um, well, the, the um, master gardeners of San Mateo County have been very busy planting um, the um, uh, pollinator habitat gardens. Uh, there's two that I can think of right now. There's one in San Carlos where I showed you that beautiful picture of the apricot mallow. And then there's a, a new one at um, uh, Foster City Library, I think is where you are right now. And uh, the, I believe those are all native plants that they put in the ground. And um, I'm trying to think, where else? Probably the, the very best place to see gardens are on that tour. And right now you can do that via uh, YouTube. Just go to the, the, uh, to the Growing uh, Native Garden Tour on their YouTube site and they have tons of videos that show you native gardens. And the California Native Plant Society has their own YouTube site too. You could spend all day watching videos. Another question, uh, where can you get native plants? Well, uh, Calscape has a list of nurseries and I believe I put in here a link. Did I put a link here? Native plant nurseries, right here. And that will take scape. And we have a lot of nurseries here in the Bay Area. Some, some that are really well known or over in Oakland is East Bay Wilds. And um, the fellow there, is a speaker often in uh, for California Native Plant Society. He's 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 very very knowledgeable. Uh, there's a guy in uh, San Jose that sends me posts. He writes things up, and I use them in our Master Gardener newsletter about native plants. It's called Linda Vista Nursery. I believe it's in in San Jose or thereabouts. Um, but there are many nurseries. Uh, Las Pilitas is somewhere in maybe uh, central California, somewhere thereabouts is not in our area, but he has extensive information on his website on, on native plants. So he has a giant piece of land where he, you know, he's basically doing similarly, except that he's in business. He just, he tells you what he's learned from the plants in the ground. You know, they've been there many years. So his, he, he sees the climactic changes, the impact on the plants. And so he writes about it. He has all sorts of information on his website. It's called Las Pilitas Nursery. That's another really informative one. Kind of changing subjects, I guess. Uh, do you have any tips for putting in a dry creek bed? Well, you just put the rocks down, I guess. I, no, I've never done it, but it, it's basically where you don't grow anything and you want it to look natural. And uh, usually it's a low point, but I've seen people put them just right across their front yards, you know, and then plant around it, to, you know, with reeds and, and sedges to make it look like a water, you know, like kind of like a, a, like a creek. Um, and so it's just rock mainly. And, uh, you know, if you want to suppress the weeds, you might want to put down some cardboard underneath the rocks, you know, and uh, uh, just pile it high with uh, different size rock 
so that the weeds don't grow and keeps and it stays dry and then put plants around the edges. I, I think that's basically, it's not very complicated. Uh, if somebody if somebody else has a better answer to that, please chime in. Everyone is chiming in about uh, public gardens. There's a lot of links with lots of information. Uh, another question about, uh, are all of the plants you talked about native to San Francisco County specifically or general to California? I would say generally to California, the ones I talked about, um, some of them may be native to, to uh, the ones that are on that, uh, where I plugged in my address and they say, you know, that all these natives will grow in my area um, is kind of indicative to me that, you know, they're, it, 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 when you go to Calscape, it will give you maps of areas where these plants grow. So, you know, if you really, really want to be particular about it, there are, there are ways uh, to, to find out. Another resource is, um, uh, it's not Calscape, what is the other one? Calflora, I believe, is another website. And they have good maps that show you where that particular plant grows naturally. And it's called calflora.org. And that's a different organization, but they do very similar things. I just didn't want to confuse you all with too much information, but I know that they have maps that show you where the uh, plants grow. Can you please provide more information on, on the Foothill program that you mentioned? Uh, Foothill College uh, has an excellent uh, horticulture program uh, it's a uh, it's a uh, uh, AA program, and I know a lot of people in our Master Gardener uh, uh, group have attended it, and they've become certified. You know, once you you fulfill all the requirements, you are certified as a landscape designer. I believe that is what what happens in that program. They take you, you know, they're, they're landscapers that are teaching the class. People in the business that teach the classes. And uh, you learn everything you need to know to go into business as a landscape designer. You can also take, I've taken classes, just individual classes. I took a whole class on just soil. And I was sad when that ended. It was so fascinating. I mean, it's just, you know, if you like this stuff, it is wonderful. So, uh, you know, check Foothill College every, I think they're on the quarter system now. They have uh, um, uh, classes, they rotate, you know, not every, every uh, 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 quarter is the same class, they, they vary them. So keep checking, they're not very expensive, anyone can sign up, anyone can take classes there and you can either, you know, complete the program or just take individual classes. And you can do this just about in any junior college in California, I believe. I believe that there are other ones, Evergreen maybe, uh, further south and West Valley. I believe there's one further south. You can take classes there too that are, uh, uh, let's see, what is the one? Um, it starts with an A. There's another junior college nearby that where you can take a lot of uh, these classes. So just, just check out junior colleges. They're very, very economical, and, and the people that teach these classes are in the business. They're excellent. Um, do you grow annuals, and do you have any tips for growing them? What was that again? Uh, annual plants? Annuals. Hmm. I don't think any of my plants are annuals. I believe they're all perennials. Uh, although, let me think. Uh, an annual would be... Okay, there's, there's one that I grow from seed. It's called Hooker Primrose. It's a yellow flower. I got seeds and, and uh, they, uh, just like poppies. Poppies, I believe, are annuals, right? They're the ones that die and then come back, uh, you know, if the seeds are in the ground or if you, if you plant seeds again. 
So, uh, you know, the, this is the time of year if you want wildflowers, this is the time of year to start scattering wildflower seeds or whatever seeds that you have as a, supposedly the rains, let's hope the rains come. And uh, often what happens is that they, uh, they will sprout. And then uh, if you let them stay in the ground, they will go to seed, they will scatter their seed, and then you don't do anything. And next year, they'll come right back. That's been my experience. So you pretty much my weeds are, are flowers, you know, annuals and some perennials that have gone to seed and just, uh, you know, uh, volunteered all over the yard. Uh, so it looks like there are no other questions in the chat so far. I don't know if anyone's typing anything. But... Mm -hmm. Oh. We did receive a tip about digging uh, the dry creek bed. Uh, since rock can sink into the dirt below, hardware cloth can keep it in place. Okay. There you go. Oh, we just got a new question. Uh, do you have deer or other problems with animals eating your plants? Uh, we haven't had a problem with deer. No, we haven't had a problem with animals eating. Not, not the, not the natives. I have problems with uh, rabbits getting into my vegetable garden, uh, and that's been an enormous headache. But, but not with my natives so far. the The biggest challenge with my natives is knowing how much water to give them. And, um, you know, it's, it's trial and error. You know, we, we uh, everybody that I know who, who plants natives, this is, this is a, something that we all have to learn to do. It, they're not like your conventional landscape. Uh, they, they have special needs and you have to learn what those needs are and abide by them. If anybody out there has natives and they've been uh, eaten by wildlife, speak up. We have a question. Uh, can you start by putting just a few natives and what would you recommend as starters? Uh, yes, many people start out small. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, we each have to decide what it is that we want to do. And uh, some natives you can grow in pots. And if you Google that, natives in pots, I'm sure you will find it, especially uh, the, the, the California Native Plant Society has something on that. Um, in fact, I watched a presentation recently, uh, a gal in San Mateo, and she loves manzanitas. And manzanitas are gorgeous. They, they really are spectacular. And she grows them in pots, but she says she has to water, she has to fully drench that soil. I believe she said three times a week. And usually you don't water them if they're in the ground. So they have different needs if they're in the pots. But the answer to your question, probably um, the easiest are... Um, I like the ribes. The, the, the native ribes is good. If you want a vine, you can't go wrong with, uh, with the uh, native, uh, of, um, the, the Vitus, Roger Reynolds. Uh, but if you're, if you're going to get that vine, make sure that you have a sturdy fence or structure to grow it on. Because as you can see, I had two plants, just two plants. And that thing just goes berserk. So it, one plant will cover a fence easily. So you need to have a really good uh, support to, to grow that on. Uh, the epilobium, which is the California fuchsia, is uh, very easy to grow. That can probably grow in pots. And you can get it upright so it's tall with the orange blossoms, or you can get the mounding, which is a variety that I had. Um, I mean, I'm going down the list of things that we have in our yard. Uh, oh, the, the uh, 
iris, the native iris. I didn't include that, but that is very, very easy to grow and to propagate. Uh, it's it looks just like, well, it's similar to the to the to the regular iris. It's a little more delicate, and it uh, uh, it's I believe is rhizomes, and they they uh, they um, multiply in the ground, and the clumps of irises will you need to divide them periodically, and it's not hard to do. You just <laughs> whack part of the base off. You, you dig down deep and you and you and you cut off some of the rhizomes and stick them in the ground somewhere else and they will they will do the same thing they will grow and then they'll bloom and then they'll ha they have seeds i haven't had too much luck growing uh irises from seed but uh they will grow into clumps so that's a really pretty pretty flower to grow and very easy to do now uh, I believe uh, the California Native Plant Society has a sale or two sales a year. So when you go to their website, look for that. I don't think they've had them recently because of COVID. I believe that the Grassroots um, uh, Ecology Center has a nursery with native plants up at Foothill Park. And you can uh, go to uh, go to um, Foothill Park and, and see if the, that has a nursery or maybe it's grassroots ecology. And uh, you can, uh, uh, that's another source for native plants locally, Foothill Park. I have a question about a lupine, uh, I, if that's how you pronounce it. Uh, I have a lupine that has every leaf on it dead. It was potted and in a place that was not cared for over a year, but the branches are still alive. Do you have any tips on bringing it back or do you think it's possible at all? And it's uh, very large, at least three feet tall. Well, it depends on what kind of lupin it is. Usually they're annuals, at least the ones that I've had, you know, you uh, they're like poppy seeds. You put them in the ground in the fall and they come up in the spring. That sounds like it might be a perennial lupin. I'm not sure. So first, that person needs to find out what kind of lupin it is and go to Calscape and find that lupin and read about its uh, care. Um, uh, usually the, the, the annual lupins right now are pretty much done, just like poppies. Uh, so, and if it's in a pot, it very likely is getting too much water. Uh, I'm guessing, uh, I'm, you know, that's just uh, a rough guess. But like I said, go to Calscape and look up lupins and try to identify what lupin it is. And then once you do, then it'll tell you how to take care of that plant. Uh, it's the silver leaf type. If you know which one that is. <laughs> no, it's silver leaf? Uh, silver leaved. Sil oh, silver leaf. No, I don't, I don't know that one. I only know the arroyo, which I believe is the one that you, uh, you, you, you scatter seed in the fall. That's the only one I know. And that's, that's the annual that comes up on, you know, parking strips, you see it, and then it dies back with the poppies. And that's the only one I know. But you, you go, like I say, just find it on Calscape and it'll tell you, give you a lot of information. Yes, uh, no questions waiting in the chat right now. <laughs> Anyone else has any questions? Maybe last call, write them in now. Oh, you're just saying thank yous and nice presentations in the chat now. <laughs> so, so I guess uh, since no other questions, we can finish up. Uh, we will be sending out the recording once I process it, along with the PDFs of the, the slide presentation from Leslie. Thank you, everybody. It was a pleasure to teach this class. <laughs>